Shall we bow our heads for prayer? Our Father in heaven, what a joy it is to be in your house of worship. How wonderful it is to hear the rain. And Father, we ask that the abundant rain of your Spirit will be with us this morning as we open and study your word. We thank you, Father, for the promise that you will be with us if we ask in faith. And we do so in the precious name of our beloved Savior, Jesus. Amen. Our study today is number three in the series, Catching Up to Jesus. And basically, what I would like to do as we begin is review uh, some of the things that we've studied so far, some of the common denominators or common elements. We've studied about Jesus entering the court of the sanctuary and being examined to make sure that he is the perfect lamb who has no stain of sin. And if you remember, we studied about how John the Baptist introduced Jesus as the Lamb of God. Then in our last study together, we noticed that Jesus went to the altar, which is the cross. And he actually died as the perfect Lamb. So these two stages are stages of the ministry of Jesus in the court. His examination as the perfect Lamb and his death sacrificed upon the altar. And we notice in our first two studies that there are several common denominators in the two subjects that we studied. First of all, we notice that there were definite prophecies which pointed to the work that Jesus was going to perform. There were prophecies which pointed to Jesus as the perfect Lamb. There were prophecies which pointed to the death of Jesus on the cross. But we notice that these prophecies were misunderstood by those who were called to proclaim and announce them. And because the prophecies, though they were proclaimed, were not understood, the result was a great disappointment. We notice also that God in each case called humble instruments to proclaim His message. In other words, He did not call the doctors, the theological doctors of the day and age. He called individuals who had been homeschooled. He even called children to announce that Jesus was the Messiah in the triumphal entry. We notice that at each stage there was great publicity about what Jesus was going to do at that particular stage of his ministry. We also notice that the established church of the day and age rejected the message which was being proclaimed. And then we also notice that after the disappointment, God's people restudied the prophecies about what Jesus was going to do. And as they restudied Bible prophecy, they said, how could we miss this point about what Jesus was really going to do? In other words, there was a remnant which remained and studied the Word of God and finally understood what Jesus was doing at that particular moment. Now in our study today, we're going to move on to the aspect of Christ's ministry where He moves into the holy place of the sanctuary. We're going to deal with prophecies that speak about His resurrection, His ascension, and His installation at the right hand of His Father. In other words, the door to the court now is going to close because Jesus has been presented as the perfect Lamb. He's lived a sinless life. He's already died at the altar. Therefore his work in the court is finished, the door to the court closes, and now he is going to enter through the door into the holy place of the sanctuary to perform his ministry there as intercessor and priest and empowerer of the church. Now there were specific Bible prophecies of the Old Testament that pointed to the fact that Jesus was going to resurrect, he was going to ascend, he was going to sit at the right hand of God and He was going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon His church from the holy place of the sanctuary. You say, where are those prophecies? As we begin, I would like to read three 
specific ones. The first is in Joel chapter 2 and verses 28 to 32. Here it speaks about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It says there, And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my manservants and my maidservants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This passage clearly speaks about a time when God was going to pour out His Holy Spirit upon His people. Another prophecy of the Old Testament which pointed to what Jesus was going to do in the holy place of the sanctuary is found in Psalm 16 and verses 8 through 10. This passage explicitly says that Jesus was not going to remain in the grave. He was going to resurrect and He was going to sit at the Father's right hand. Notice Psalm 16 and verse 8. Here David the psalmist is speaking. I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my glory rejoices. And now notice this, my flesh also will rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Sheol. The word soul there is translated in the NIV, me. You will not leave me in Sheol, that is the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. Very clearly the flesh of Jesus would rest in hope because his flesh would not see corruption, he would not be allowed to remain in Sheol or in the grave. And then it continues saying, You will show me the path of life. Your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Very clearly, he was not going to remain in the grave. He was going to resurrect. And he was going to sit at the Father's right hand where there are pleasures forevermore. Another prophecy from the Old Testament which pointed to the ascension and enthronement of Jesus is Psalm 110 and verse 1. Psalm 110 and verse 1. It says there, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. There's two Lords in this text. The Lord said to the Lord. It's really the Father speaking to His Son, Jesus Christ. And then when you go to verse 4, it says, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, He's going to sit at the right hand of His Father to be priest after the order of Melchizedek. So there were very clear prophecies that Jesus was going to resurrect, His body was not going to see corruption, He was going to ascend to heaven, He was going to sit at the Father's right hand, He was going to be priest, and He was going to pour out the Holy Spirit upon His people. And yet unfortunately, His followers did not fully understand these prophecies. Not even ten days before these prophecies were fulfilled did they understand what these prophecies meant. And you say, how is that? Go with me to Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 and you'll see it very clearly. Jesus gathers His disciples. He's about to ascend. He spent 40 days on planet earth. He's explained scripture to them during the 40 days. And yet they don't understand really what Jesus is going to do. Notice the questions that the disciples asked Jesus. Then they asked Jesus, Acts 1 verse 6, 
Will you restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? In other words, are you going to sit on the throne of David? Are you going to take over the kingdom on planet earth and rule in Jerusalem? Well, Jesus had just spent 40 days with them. You would think that they would know what these prophecies that we began with meant. And yet they didn't. Ellen White has a very interesting uh, comment about this question that the disciples asked Jesus. It's found in a pamphlet, and the name of the pamphlet is Redemption, or the Ministry of Peter and the Conversion of Saul. This is what she says. When Jesus opened the understanding of the disciples to the meaning of the prophecies concerning himself, he assured them that all power was given him in heaven and on earth, and bade them go preach the gospel to every creature. And now here comes the key portion of the comment. The disciples, with a sudden revival of their old hope that Jesus would take his place upon the throne of David at Jerusalem, inquired, Wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? They didn't know what Jesus was going to do in heaven. They did not understand these prophecies, even though Jesus had spent 40 days with them. In fact, even on the day of Pentecost, before Peter preached, they still didn't understand. Because you'll notice in Acts chapter 2 and verse 11, when the Holy Spirit is poured out, the people ask, whatever could this mean? What could this mean? And others who were present there said, oh, they're just drunk. So they still didn't understand until, as we'll notice, Peter explained the meaning of the prophecies with which we began our study. Now I'd like to say that as a result of not understanding these prophecies and saying to Jesus, will you restore the kingdom at this time, the disciples were disappointed in their expectations. In fact, Jesus did something just opposite of what they were expecting. He told them, go to Jerusalem, go to the upper room, wait there for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And then Jesus, instead of taking over the throne of the kingdom in Jerusalem, we're told in Acts chapter 1 and verses 9 through 11, He ascends to heaven and He leaves the disciples. No doubt they were heartbroken. We thought this fellow was going to take over the throne. And instead of taking over the throne, now he's left. By the way, let me ask you, had Jesus told them that he was going to leave? Of course he had, all during his ministry. By the way, had he told them that he was going to die? Yes. Were there prophecies that he was going to be a perfect lamb? Yes. But they did not understand these prophecies. And so Jesus, instead of taking over the throne, he leaves for heaven. And then the disciples gather in the upper room, as Jesus had said, and so they say, we need to go back to the drawing board. We need to pray, and we need to search Scripture to see if we can understand exactly what Jesus is doing. And they started remembering that Jesus had said He was going to leave. But what is He going to do up there? Here we thought He was going to take over the kingdom. Now let me ask you, was what Jesus was going to do in heaven greatly publicized on earth? Oh yes it was. It was publicized on the day of Pentecost. Notice what we find in Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4. Do you remember that John the Baptist announced that Jesus was the Lamb of God who was going to take away the sin of the world? Do you remember that in the triumphal entry there was an announcement that Jesus was the King and that He died on the cross? They didn't understand exactly what was happening. Well, the fact is that there was an earthly announcement that Jesus was going to begin a new phase of His ministry in the holy place of the sanctuary. And it was announced powerfully on earth. Notice Acts chapter 2 and verses 1 to 4. Now when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly 
there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. I want you to remember that word, wind. There was the sound of, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where, where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire. Two natural phenomena, wind and fire. Very important. And it says, And one sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Two phenomena on the day of Pentecost. Wind and fire. This is happening on earth. But we're going to notice that it really is an announcement of something that is happening where? Something that Jesus is doing in heaven. You see, when Jesus changes his ministry, there's an announcement on earth of what exactly he's doing. Now we're told that as a result of the mighty rushing wind and the tongues as of fire, they all began to speak in different tongues. By the way, these were languages. Do you know when is the first time in Scripture that God gave the gift of tongues? At the Tower of Babel. What? Yes. Were the languages of the world established at Babel? Yes, they were. So the gift of tongues was given at Babel. Of course at Babel the purpose was to divide people. At Pentecost it was to unite people. But still it was the gift of tongues. Now I want you to read, I want to read you a very significant statement from Signs of the Times, March 20, 1879. Because I want you to understand what happened on Pentecost. Why there was this mighty rushing wind and why there were tongues of fire. Who confused the languages at Babel? Who gave the gift of tongues at Babel? Notice this statement, speaking about the builders. They had built their tower to a lofty height. When the Lord sent two angels to confound them. Excuse me? Who confused the languages? Two angels. She continues saying, Men had been appointed for the purpose of receiving word from the workmen at the top of the tower, calling for material for their work which the first would communicate to the second, and he to the third, until the message reached those upon the ground. As the word was passing from one to another in its descent, the angels confounded their language. Who confounded, who gave the gift of tongues? The angels confounded their language. And when the word reached the workmen upon the ground, material was called for for which had not been required. And after the laborious process of getting the material to the workmen at the top of the tower, it was not that which they had wished for. Disappointed and enraged, they reproached those whom they supposed were at fault. After this, there was no harmony in their work, angry with one another, and unable to account for the misunderstanding and strange words among them, they left the work and scattered abroad in the earth. And now notice this comment. Up to this time, Men had spoken but one language. Those who could understand one another, this is after the languages were confused, those who could understand one another associated together and thus originated various nations speaking different languages. Who was it that gave the gift of tongues at the Tower of Babel? God through the ministration of what? Of angels. Now do you remember the wind and the tongues of fire? Go with me to Psalm 104 and verses 3 and 4. Psalm 104 and verses 3 and 4. I want, I, I want to talk for a moment about the ministration of the angels. We need to understand the ministration of the angels in order to understand what happened at Pentecost. Psalm 104 and verse 3 says, speaking about God, he lays the beams of his upper chambers in the waters, who makes the clouds his chariot. What are clouds symbolically in Scripture? Angels. He makes the clouds his chariot. And now notice this. Who walks on the wings of the what? Of the wind. And now comes the key portion. 
who makes his angels spirits. Now allow me to tell you something about that word spirits. It's the Hebrew word ruach, which very frequently in the Old Testament is translated winds or wind. And in the New Testament the very word that is used for the Holy Spirit is also used to speak about the ministering spirits, the ministration of the angels. So this could very properly be translated, who makes his angels winds, and then it explains his ministers a what? A flame of fire. What is represented by the winds? Angels. What about flames of fire? Angels. Are you saying, Pastor Bohr, that God on the day of Pentecost gave the gift of tongues through the ministration of the angels? That's exactly what I'm saying. And in a few moments I'm going to explain to you what happened on the day of Pentecost. By the way, consistently in Scripture the angels are associated with fire as is the Holy Spirit. Notice for example, 2 Kings 6, 17 and 18, Jerusalem was surrounded at this time, and uh, the people were afraid that the enemy was going to overwhelm the city, and Elisha prayed to the Lord that he would open the eyes of his servants so that his servant could see that Jerusalem was well protected. Notice 2 Kings 6, 17 and 18. It says, And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of what? Horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. What were those chariots of fire? Those chariots of fire were angels. You say, well how do we know that? Well, for the very simple reason that Psalm 68 verse 17 says, the chariots of God are twenty thousand, even thousands of thousands. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. The chariots of God are His angels. These chariots of fire were angels marching above the city of Jerusalem. By the way, in Ezekiel chapter 1 verses 12 and 13, the four living creatures, which are the commanders of the angelic hosts, are also compared with fire. Notice Ezekiel 1 verses 12 and 13. It says there, As for the likeness of the living creatures, their appearance was like the burning of coals of fire, and like the appearance of torches. Fire was going back and forth among the living creatures. The fire was bright, and out of the fire went lightning. And the living creatures ran back and forth in appearance like a flash of lightning. Interesting that in the Old Testament the angels are called winds and they are called flames of fire. The very two phenomena that took place when? On the day of Pentecost. It is not a stretch to think that if on the day of Pentecost there's the phenomena of wind and fire and the languages, the gift of speaking languages is given to the disciples, then it must be angels because as we read back at the Tower of Babel, God through the ministration of the angels gave the gift of tongues at Pentecost. Now I want to share with you some very interesting statements where Ellen White actually in commenting about Pentecost she speaks about the works of work of the angels at Pentecost, and then in the same breath she speaks about the work of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. In other words, the Holy Spirit is accomplishing His work through the ministration of the angelic host. Listen to this statement. My Life Today, page 58. My Life Today, page 58. When the truth of God in its simplicity is lived in every place, now pay close attention, then God will work through His angels as He worked on the day of Pentecost. Did you catch that point? 
When the truth in its simplicity is lived in every place, then God will work through His angels as He worked on the day of Pentecost. And hearts will be changed so decidedly that there will be a manifestation of the influence of genuine, genuine truth as is represented in the descent of the Holy Spirit. Notice this statement. Volume 2 of Selected Messages, page 57. She says, When the angels of heaven come among us... When who comes among us? When the angels of heaven come among us and work through human agents, there will be solid, substantial conversions after the order of the conversions after the day of Pentecost. Are you noticing what she's saying? She's saying that what happened on the day of Pentecost was that God unleashed the heavenly host. By the way, up till this point, who had claimed rulership of this world? The devil did. He said, this is my world, and I can give it to whomever I please. But when Jesus died on the cross, what did He do? He took away the kingdom from the devil, and this actually gave Jesus the right to what? To invade the territory of Satan, to unleash on the day of Pentecost all of the angelic host. In other words, on the day of Pentecost, all of heaven's angels were unleashed by orders of the Holy Spirit. And thousands, the Bible says, were converted in one day. Winds and tongues of fire, symbolically speaking. Allow me to read you another few statements on this point. This one is found in the book Maranatha, a devotional book, page 212. Ellen White says here, before the work is closed up, now she's speaking about the end, and the sealing of God's people is finished, we shall receive the outpouring of the Spirit of God. And then notice what she says in the next sentence. Angels from heaven will be in our midst. What is going to be poured out? The Holy Spirit. Who will be in our midst? Angels will be in our midst. One more statement, Review and Herald, January 20, 1891. She says, after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, thousands were converted. You say, why were thousands converted? We listen to what she continues saying. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, thousands were converted. Angels of God that excel in strength clothed with the brightness of heaven, came to the help of the church and swept back the forces of Satan. Isn't that an amazing statement? I'll read it again. After the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, thousands were converted. Who were the ones that spoke in the ear of the people who were converted? The Holy Spirit through what? Through the ministration of the angels. She says, angels of God that excel in strength, clothed with the brightness of heaven, came to the help of the church and swept back the forces of Satan. And then she says, the work of the Holy Spirit was not limited to apostolic days. It is not confined to any church, large or small. The field of His ministration is the world. He will convince the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. But the instrumentalis instrumentalities through which the Holy Spirit works are the members of Christ's body, those who believe in His name. It is through these light bearers that the gospel is to be carried to all the nations of the earth. In other words, the chain of command is the Holy Spirit unleashes the angelic host to speak to those who need to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and Lord, and then the angels win these converts to the Lord, and then these individuals become servants and instruments in the hands of the Holy Spirit to reach other people. You know what happened on the day of Pentecost? Was actually an earthly announcement of a heavenly event. Usually we focus on what happened on earth. 
You know, you listen to preachers on television, these television preachers talk about what happened on the day of Pentecost, and they focused on the fact that everybody start speaking in, started speaking in other tongues, and that there were tongues of fire, and there was a mighty rushing wind, and that the church received the Holy Spirit, and they went out to preach. But do you know what? The key event was not what happened on earth, but what happened in heaven. The earthly event was an announcement of a heavenly event. What was announced by the Holy Spirit being poured out by the tongues of fire, by the mighty rushing wind, by the unleashing of the heavenly host, was the fact that Jesus had ascended to heaven, He had sat down as at the right hand of His Father, He was now the intercessor of His people, and now He was pouring out the Holy Spirit as a sign that He had been installed in the holy place to perform His work. In fact, let me read you from Acts of the Apostles, page 38. Ellen White caught this point. There's not very many scholars that have caught this connection between the heavenly event and the earthly event. Ellen White caught it very clearly. She says this, The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. According to His promise, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token. What is a token? Sign. Indication, if you please. Once again, he had sent the Holy Spirit from heaven to his followers as a token that he had, as priest and king, received all authority in heaven and on earth and was the anointed one over his people. So was the change in ministration of Jesus announced with great earthly publicity, just like his death on the cross, just like the moment that he presented himself as the perfect Lamb of God who has no sin? Absolutely. Were the prophecies misunderstood? Yes. Were God's people disappointed? Yes. Was there publicity? Yes, there was publicity. Now let me ask you, how did the established church of the day and age receive the message which was imparted on the day of Pentecost? It was the Jewish church of the day. They said, oh, this is wonderful. Yeah, Jesus just went to heaven and he began his ministry up there. Is that the way the church reacted? No. The church of the day and age actually rejected what Jesus was doing in the, most, in the holy place of the sanctuary. You see, if we're going to follow Jesus through the sanctuary, we have to follow Him in order. First, you have to accept Him as the perfect Lamb, because He lived the life that you and I should live. Second, we must accept Him as our sacrifice. He died in my place. And then I am ready to go into the holy place and to accept Him as my intercessor and my representative before the Father. I can now claim the benefits of His sacrifice. But I can't follow Him into the holy place of the sanctuary and accept Him as my intercessor unless first of all I understand that He lived the life I should live and He died the death that I should die. And because the Sanhedrin and the leaders of the Jewish nation refused to follow Jesus into the court. They rejected the message of John. They rejected the message of the triumphal entry. They were unprepared to understand what Jesus was beginning to do in the holy place of the sanctuary. In fact, you know the story after the day of Pentecost, the Sanhedrin got together and they told Peter and John, don't talk about this anymore. Keep your mouth shut. Don't speak in the name of Jesus. There are too many people that are accepting this message. In other words, the message was rejected by the established church. And it was only a small remnant that accepted the message and understood that Jesus had moved into the holy place of the sanctuary. Allow me to read you an interesting statement that we find in the book, Great Controversy, page 430. By the way, was there a shut door and an open door here on Pentecost? What door was shut? The door of the court. Had Jesus fulfilled the work of the court? Had he, had he finished? Yes. In fact, what did He say on the cross? It is what? It is finished. 
He's saying, I finished the work of living a perfect life and dying for sin. It is finished. At that moment, he's about to close the door of the court because he's finished his ministration there. But now, that door is closed. Is there another door opened? Yes, it's the door to the holy place. He's going to do his work, not as sacrifice, but as priest. And in our next study together, we're going to notice that the door to the holy place is closed, and another door, the door of the most holy place, opens in 1844. And this whole experience is repeated all over again. The religious establishment rejects the message, and it's only a small remnant that follows Jesus through the open door into the most holy place of the sanctuary. There is nothing new under the sun. Allow me to read you Ellen White's description of what happened to the, to the Jewish nation, to the established church of the day and age when Jesus moved into the holy place. They were oblivious that Jesus had moved. She says this, When Jesus at his ascension entered by his own blood into the heavenly sanctuary, now listen to this, to shed upon his disciples the blessings of his mediation, See, Jesus died. Did Jesus pay the debt for every human being on planet earth? So everybody's going to be saved. No. Do you, have to claim, do you have to claim what Jesus did? Yes. You see, now Jesus is accepting his clients, so to speak. People that, that claim for themselves what he did on the cross. The perfect life he lived. We come in repentance to him, and now his sacrifice is credited to my account because I have asked him to be my intercessor before the Father. So she continues saying, When Jesus at his ascension entered by his own blood into the heavenly sanctuary to shed upon his disciples the blessings of his mediation, the Jews were left in total darkness. I want you to remember that expression. In our next subject we're going to come back to that. To continue their useless sacrifices and offerings. The ministrations of types and shadows had ceased. That door by which men had formerly found access to God was no longer open. The Jews had refused to seek Him in the only way whereby He could then be found, through the ministration in the sanctuary in heaven. Therefore they found no communion with God. To them the door was shut. They had no knowledge of Christ as the true sacrifice and the only mediator before God. Hence, they could not receive the benefits of His mediation. Because they did not follow Him into the court, they did not follow Him into the holy place. And by the way, it is a process. You have to follow Jesus first into the court. You have to understand that He lived a perfect life that he paid the debt for sin and that now you can receive him as your representative in heaven you can claim what he did and make it your own individually the Jewish nation the established church rejected this now let me ask you on the day of Pentecost was the disappointment of the disciples clarified by a study of scripture Did they fully come to understand what Jesus was doing on the basis of re-evaluating and understanding Scripture? Absolutely. You say, how's that? Well, have you ever read Peter's sermon on the day of Pentecost? I'm sure that you've read Acts chapter 2, beyond verse 11. You know, in verse 11 and verse 13, the, the, the people who are present there, they say, what, what can this mean? Some say, ah, oh, no, they're just drunk. And Peter's going to say, it can't be drunk, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. There has to be some other explanation. And then Peter stands up. And Peter takes those verses with which we began our study today, and he says, okay folks, what we didn't understand when we asked Jesus, will you restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? He says, now we understand. In those ten days they had studied the prophecies after Jesus left. 
And now Peter says, now those uh, prophecies from the Old Testament, I'm going to tell you what they really mean. Did Scripture clarify what Jesus was doing? Absolutely. Allow me to read you from Acts chapter 2 verses 16 to 21. You tell me if this is the same passage from Joel chapter 2. Here Peter says, But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my manservants and on my maidservants I will pour out my Spirit in those days. They shall prophesy. I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Is this the same passage from Joel chapter 2? Peter is saying, what you see right here is exactly what was prophesied. It's taking place right now. Jesus is in heaven and He's poured out the Holy Spirit. This is an indication of something that has happened in heaven. Jesus has entered the holy place and He has begun His ministration there. Now notice Acts chapter 2 verses 25 through 28. Tell me if we've read this passage before. Acts chapter 2, 25 to 28. For David says concerning Him, that is Jesus, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for He is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Is that the same passage that we notice from the Old Testament? Psalm 16? Here Peter is saying, now we know, that pointed to Jesus. He died. His body saw no corruption. He resurrected. And He sat down at the right hand of God. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is an indication of the work that He has begun to do in the holy place of the sanctuary. Now you remember the third verse, Psalm 110 and verse 1? Notice Acts chapter 2 and verses 34 and 35. Acts chapter 2 34 and 35. For David did not ascend into the heavens. In other words, Psalm 16 wasn't talking about David. David wasn't talking about himself. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Interesting. Do God's people now understand these prophecies and comprehend what Jesus is doing at this point in the heavenly sanctuary? They most surely do. In other words, after the disappointment, they study scripture and their concepts are clarified. They say we were wrong about what Jesus was going to do. He was not going to sit down on the throne of David in Jerusalem as king. He has gone to sit next to his father on his throne in order to present the cases of all of those who come to him before the Father and to send the Holy Spirit through the ministration of the angels to give power to his people to let the world know what Jesus is doing. By the way, Revelation 3.21 points to the moment that Jesus took His place next to the Father. It says them there in Revelation 3 verse 21, To Him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my Father on His throne. So this text from the New Testament clearly shows that Jesus fulfilled prophecy. He sat at the Father's right hand. Furthermore, the Bible speaks about an open door through which Jesus went. It's not only Ellen White. Notice Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2. And we've spoken about this passage of Revelation 4 previously, so I won't get into a lot of detail. Here John says, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set up in heaven, and one sat on the throne like whom? Like the Son of Man. By the way, was a door opened in order, in order for this scene to take place? 
Notice Revelation chapter 4 and verse 1. Revelation 4 and verse 1. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open, open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things which much must take place after this. So there's an open door. And by the way, if you continue reading in Revelation 4, you're going to notice that there where the door is opened are found the seven candlesticks. And the altar of incense is in there. Which apartment was the candlestick found in? In the holy place. Where was the altar of incense located? In the holy place. So the door which is opened here, through which John goes, and eventually sees Jesus arrive at the throne, is none other than the door that leads to the holy place of the sanctuary. In other words, the door to the court has been closed, and the door to the holy place has been opened. In other words, Jesus is saying, the sanctuary is now open for business. Now you can claim the payment that I made. By the way, did Jesus pay the debt for all of humanity? Of course. Did he buy, did he buy the gift of salvation for everyone? Of course he did. He paid for it, didn't he? Infinite price. He paid for everyone. Does that mean that everybody is going to accept the payment? You see, what happens on the day of Pentecost, folks, is that now people can individually claim what Jesus did. You can claim His perfect life. You say, Jesus, my life is a mess. It's full of sin. I'm sorry. Take your life and credit it to my account. And impart it into me so I can live it. Jesus, I deserve death. But now, in repentance, I claim your death so that I don't have to suffer it. At that moment, Jesus goes before the Father. He represents me. And the Father doesn't look at me. The Father looks at Him. Is that good news? Can I get half of an amen? amen. That's good news. That's what's happened since Pentecost. People can come to Jesus, and Jesus will receive their prayers. In fact, let's notice a few texts from the New Testament which amplify this point. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 12. Hebrews 9 and verse 12, and I'm reading from the King James Version. It says there, Neither by the blood of bulls and calves, but by His own blood, He entered in once into the holy place. Many versions say most holy place. Not a good translation. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Notice Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, speaking about what Jesus does for us today. Folks, what Jesus is doing today is He wants us to claim what, what He paid for. He wants us to take what He paid for and put it on our account. It says in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost. Whom? Those who come to God through Him. Those who come to Him. Since He always lives to do what? To make intercession for them. Notice Romans 8 and verse 34. There's so many texts that speak about this. Romans 8 and verse 34. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes what? Who also makes intercession for us. So the court points to Jesus as the perfect lamb. It points to Jesus as the perfect sacrifice. The holy place points to Jesus as our only intercessor when we claim Him personally as our Savior and as our Lord. But that is not all that Jesus is doing in the holy place of the sanctuary. He's not only receiving our prayers in repentance, He is also pouring out the power of His Spirit so that we can tell other people about what He's doing. What did Jesus say in Acts chapter 1? 
and verse 7 to his disciples. Actually, let's read verse 8. Acts 1 verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be what? Witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to where? And to the end of the earth. What good is it for Jesus to be performing a work in the holy place if nobody knows about it? On the day of Pentecost, Jesus is explaining through Peter what he went to heaven to do until 1844. But only if they, only they know about it, what about the world? So Jesus says, I'm not only going to represent you, I'm empowering you through the Holy Spirit, through the ministration of the angels, millions of them just waiting to work with you for you to go and tell the world about me living a perfect life dying on the cross of Calvary and now they can come and they can claim what I have done and make it their own wow not only forgiveness but power in fact notice Acts chapter 5 verses 31 to 33 Acts 5 31 to 33 very interesting here Peter is explaining to, to, to the Jews who are listening to him what Jesus is doing in heaven. Him, that is Jesus, God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior and to do what? To give repentance to Israel and what else? And forgiveness of sins. Let me ask you, do we need to confess our sins in order to be forgiven from our sins? Do we have to repent of them first? Do we have to bring them to Jesus? Of course we do. That's what this is talking about. Verse 32, And we are His witnesses to these things, and so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey Him. By the way, was the sorrow of the disciples turned into joy when they understood what Jesus was doing? Was the sorrow because Jesus had left turned into joy? Notice John 16 and verse 20. Very interesting. Jesus had told them that they were going to have, be disappointed, they were going to be sad, and they were going to be filled with sorrow, but their sorrow on Pentecost would be turned to joy because they would understand Scripture. Notice John 16 verse 20. Most assuredly I say to you that you will weep and lament there's sadness coming, I'm leaving, you're going to weep and lament. But the world will rejoice. In other words, when you weep and lament, the world is going to make fun of you. And you will be sorrowful. But, now notice this, but your sorrow will be turned into what? Your sorrow will be turned into joy. So was a bitter disappointment at the idea that Jesus did not fulfill their expectations, changed into joy when they understand, understood the true meaning of these prophecies. Absolutely, their sorrow was turned to joy. And when we study the next time, about 1844, we're going to notice that after the bitter disappointment, because Jesus did not fulfill prophecy according to their expectations, they went back to the drawing board, they studied scripture, they understood that Jesus had gone into the most holy place of the sanctuary to begin his final ministration in the sanctuary, and their sorrow was turned into joy. They felt like the two disciples on the road to Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within ourselves as he opened unto us the scriptures. By the way, when Peter preached about what Jesus was doing in heaven at that moment, was there a huge number of converts that came to Jesus as clients now? Did it spread? Of course it did. It, did. it says that there were 3,000 that day who came to understand what Jesus was doing. Because Peter spoke about the sacrifice of Jesus. He spoke about what Jesus had done in the court. He says, now he's gone to heaven. He's interceding. Now you can get forgiveness of sins. He's willing to intercede for you. So when Peter finishes his sermons, his sermon, the men say, well, what do we need to do in the light of this new revelation about what Jesus is doing in the holy place? What should we do? 
This is a case of people asking the pastor, what do I need to do? What did Peter say? Be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. I'm dreaming for the day when we have 3,000 people coming to me and saying, what shall we do? And I say, arise, be baptized for the forgiveness of sins and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Not a case of me begging people to be baptized, but people coming and saying, I want to be baptized. I want to follow Jesus into the holy place of the sanctuary. Now allow me to read you Acts chapter 2 and verses 36 to 39 in closing. Peter here explains what's happening on Pentecost. Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus whom you crucified both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, notice now they understand the meaning of prophecy. Now when they heard this they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and to the rest of the disciples, Men and brethren, what shall we do in the, love, in the light of this? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So there's nothing new under the sun. Three disappointments because of false expectations. Three explanations of the, dis of the disappointments. Sorrow turned into joy. Now in our next study together we're going to study the great disappointment of 1844. And you're going to find that it follows the exact sequence of the first three that we've studied. People say that the Adventist view can't be true because of 1844, we'll see that that is not the case. Mm -hmm.